He is faithful. Praise the Lord. So if you'll turn over to the Gospel of Matthew in the fourth chapter tonight. And we're going to begin reading there in verse 12. Finished up on the temptation of Jesus this morning. Amen. Uh, with the question, the title of the message this morning was, praise God, about the humanity of Jesus. How human was Jesus? Look at your neighbor and say, how human was Jesus? We answer the question, do you have to have a sin nature to be fully human? And if you weren't here, I'm not going to tell you what we said, because I want you to listen to the message. Okay, praise God, it will change your life. It really will. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So now we're going to move beyond the temptation of Jesus. And uh, let's look in verse 12, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 4, try to finish up this chapter tonight so that we can go into the uh, Sermon on the Mount next Sunday morning, God willing. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord God. All right, verse 12, if you have it, say amen. amen. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea, say the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Amen. Amen. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. They brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse, diverse diseases, torments, those which were possessed with devils, those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you right now for your awesome word tonight. We glorify you for your word tonight. We thank you, God, for it. We give our hearts to it, God, our minds to it. Father, we thank you for everything that you have done for us. In Jesus' mighty name, the title of the message tonight, The Going Forth of the King. The Going Forth of the King. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. All right, we saw the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been teaching that to you. And about a year later brings us to verse 12. So there is about 12 months between verse 11 and verse 12. Amen. Now, why is that? Well, Matthew is focusing on the king and his kingdom, the movement of the king. And so his focus is going to be up this particular area of the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ. If you study the gospel of John, you will see some other events that take place uh, before this time here. Now, the scripture tells us, if you'll notice, John is cast into prison. So he's at the end of his ministry. His ministry is closing out. And Jesus is coming now, and he's going to start his kingly ministry. So you can kind of get a feel for the text here that we're not talking about right at the beginning of his ministry. 
So about 12 months or so have, has a last between verse 11 and verse 12. Amen. John is cast into prison. At that time, notice the Bible says at that time, he departed into Galilee. So he leaves Nazareth. He come and he dwelt Capernaum. Capernaum of Galilee becomes his headquarters at this point. Okay. Now the Bible goes on and tells us something about this place of Galilee. It says he left Nazareth. He came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, "The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way." Of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in re the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. So let's go over to Isaiah chapter 9, please. And this is the prophecy that Jesus is referring to here, or the Gospel of Matthew is referring to, beginning with verse 1. So you'll kind of understand what is happening. The prophet Isaiah is looking out over his land at this point in the prophecy in his day. And he sees darkness. He has seen devastation. He has seen one battle after another. He has seen the devastation of the Assyrians who have invaded into the land. And this part of Israel is taking the biggest hit. Okay. It's the one that's been devastated the most. And so as the prophet is looking at this territory in the land of Israel, he sees its darkness and he sees death everywhere. He looks beyond that time of his day and he sees prophetically into the time that Jesus Christ will come. And when he comes in the place of death, there will be life. In the place of darkness, there will be light. So this gives hope to the prophet Isaiah as he looks in what we would call mountain peaks of prophecy. Because he sees in his day the devastation of that territory. But he looks way off into the future. And he sees that mountain peak of prophecy. Where the king would come. And when he comes. The people that sat in darkness. A great light is going to appear. And the region of death that had been trampled down by army after army after army. He said life is coming there. Amen. And when we look at this territory, we have to understand uh, what is happening here. So 9 of Isaiah, verse 1, says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it were in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of who? The nations. At that point, Galilee was primarily controlled by Gentiles. Okay, amen. amen. Verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined. Amen. And so now we see the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy hundreds of years down the road. He sees this light coming where darkness was. We see life coming where death was, etc. Into this region called Galilee. Now when we look at Galilee, you have to understand that from the Jerusalem Jews perspective, this was the downcast. These were the outcast people. These were the rejects. Okay, They weren't the Jerusalem Jews. These are the, the Jews that live over in Galilee, you know. And there was a time in history... When they took over the promised land, that a lot of the Jewish people did not run out. Every, all the Gentiles, they coexisted with, if you will, demon, demon people. He let them, they let them stay there. And they were willing to co co inhabit, cohabit, excuse me, with people that were not right with God, with idolaters. And God had told, told them to clean house and to run them out of the land. But the Jewish people, many of them didn't do that. And they left that cohabitation with idolaters in the land with them. And so now the Bible calls them the Galilee of the Gentiles. Even though Jews were there, there were still Gentiles that were still in that area. Okay? So they were really looked down upon by the Jerusalem Jews. These were the outcasts. These are the people that are like Gentiles in their mind. The problem is, is that these Jews that lived in Galilee were very devout to the covenant of God. So even though they were looked down upon, they were very de devout to Torah realistically in time you with me now okay 
So Jesus, the Bible tells us he leaves Nazareth. Why does he leave Nazareth? Well, if you look in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says that he stood up in the synagogue and he preached to them. And he said, what? This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And he gave the scroll to the minister, correct? You remember that prophecy, Luke 4? Right after he did that, they tried to throw him off a cliff. That was his hometown. They tried to kill him in his own hometown. Amen. You talk about a welcome. It kind of gets me a little bit concerned because Odessa, Texas is where I was born. This is my hometown, literally my hometown. Are y'all with me here today? And I'm not a prophet, but the Bible says a prophet is not accepted in his own town. So I'm a little bit concerned that God called me to my hometown. It hasn't been easy, right? But they literally tried to throw Jesus off of a cliff. And so Jesus said, well, it's time for me to change locations. Would you blame me? And he didn't go over to Jerusalem and preach there. Why? Because they didn't have time for him. So he bypassed Jerusalem where the religious leaders were because they don't have time for him. He leaves Nazareth, his hometown, because they tried to kill him. And he goes over to Galilee, and there in, there in Galilee, Capernaum, he set up his headquarters. The king is there, and he begins to minister there in Galilee, where there was major darkness. But in that major darkness, that's where the light came. Amen. Amen. Outcasts, people that were outcast and rejected, that's to whom he came. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he brought light in the place of that darkness, in the place of that death. But he, I want you to understand, he didn't go there to change the social atmosphere. He went there to call people to God. That's why he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, we're in a time right now, so many people are focused on the social upheavals in the world, right? Well, let me tell you, Jesus is not really focused on the social upheavals of the world. What he would be focused on is you getting back to God, repenting. Because what you have to understand, the reason why there's darkness in our world is because first there's darkness in people. And Jesus understood that. And so when he went into that land that was full of darkness and death, he understood because darkness and death was in them. They had to change before the atmosphere, before society would change. They've got to change. If you want to know what the answer today is for the problems of society in the realm of the social, the problem is the reason why there's darkness and death and all kinds of chaos is because that's what's inside of people. And until people turn back to God, you hearing me tonight, until they turn back to God and deal with the darkness that's in them and the death that is in them, no social rehabilitation no social recovery will do any good because they'll go right back into the mess they were in right back into the darkness and right back into the death so when Jesus came he understood as the true light of the world going into darkness he didn't go in there to bring social reform he called people back to God and to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Until you get darkness out of you, until you get death out of you or out of me or out of everybody, all you're going to have is darkness on the outside. He did not come to bring social reform. He called everybody back to God. And when people turn back to God and repent and get their hearts right, and get light on the inside of them. And life on the inside of them. Then that will change society. You don't try to bring social reform. You call people to God. Heard Brother Jared preach. He preached an awesome message. A Friday night to the youth. And he was talking about that very thing. He said you could go to rehab. Are you with me here? You could go to rehab. But if you don't have God. You're just going to go right back to the mess that you were in. And that is the truth. And Jesus knew that. That's why he came. And he said, repent. The message is still the same. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get light on the inside of you. Get life on the inside of you. And that will change the society. The social realm that you're in. Give God praise in this house. I told you before, it's ultimately not about what color of skin you have. Ultimately, that's not what it's all about. That's what a lot of people want to make it about because they have political agendas. 
But it's not about that. It's about getting God in your heart. Getting God in your life. And repenting. And getting that darkness out of you. Because until you get the darkness out of you. Your environment's not going to change. It's going to stay dark. So Jesus knew that. That's why he came. And a great light, the Bible said, a great light. Who is the great light? Jesus is the great light. And he came into that region of the world. Uh Oh, the outcast, downcast, death everywhere through history. One battle after another. The land was devastated. Devastated, devastated. Like burned buildings like we see in the United States of America. Buildings burned to the ground. Devastation everywhere. People need Jesus. They need God. Our need, our, our need is to turn back to God. Because until the darkness gets out of you, you'll be dark. Now, I hate to tell you tonight, but Odessa, Texas is a lot like Galilee. It sure is. And when you stand up and you preach in, in Odessa, Texas, this is one of the most difficult places you'll ever preach in. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about this city. I'm talking about this area. It's one of the most difficult areas to preach in. You know why? Because people are full of darkness. And when you look at them, you can see the darkness on their face. They don't have the glory of God. They don't have the light shining in them. They're dark. You know why they're dark? Because they're dark on the inside. And God called us to be filled with His light, with His glory. We are to radiate with the glory of God. So if you're gloomy and dark tonight, it's because you are dark. Give God praise in this house. And so he came into that region of death and that region of darkness to call people back to God Almighty. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's what the United States of America needs. We need to repent and turn back to God Almighty. You can make it about this and you can make it about that and all of that foolishness. But it's because people don't walk with God. Somebody said amen. Amen. So this location of darkness and death. This this location of the rejects, if you will. Those that are looked down upon by others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In a sense, sort of, you know, discrimination. And Jesus knew all about that. He knew all about that discrimination. He knew all about it. But he wasn't a revolutionary. You hear what I'm telling you? He didn't try to come to bring social reform. I'm going to preach to you again. He called people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Galilee of the Gentiles. Now what does that mean? It doesn't mean that Galilee only had Gentiles living in it. But there were Gentile cities all around this area. Now the Sea of Galilee was there. It's called the Sea of Galilee. It was really a, a pond. It's about 13 miles by 8 miles. It's a little pond. But they called it the Sea of Galilee. See, it all depends on your perspective. If you haven't been anywhere in the world, a 13 by 8 pond, you would call it a sea. But if you study the Gospel of Luke, Luke traveled. He was in the ships. He traveled. He knew what it was like to be out of those big, big seas and big oceans. He didn't call it a sea. He called it a lake. See, are you with me here tonight? If you've never been anywhere, like some of them were, some of these Galileans, if they they, they never, so they, to them, a 13 by 8 mile little pond, that's a sea. Praise the Lord. It's all about your perspective. Hallelujah. With the sea, what they call the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee, Gennesaret, little 13 by 8, 13 mile by 8 mile wide. Little old thing, not very big, just basically a pond. Are you with me today? Praise God. And here are these Gentile communities, or Jewish communities living among Gentiles. You got Syrians, you got all kinds of different Gentiles that are living in that area. Praise God. Just all kind of hunkered down, living together, right? Darkness and death everywhere. It's a mess, man. A lot of problems there. Here comes Jesus. Man, our world needs Jesus. Odessa, Texas needs Jesus. This church needs Jesus. You need Jesus. Every one of us needs Jesus. Without Him, we're as dark as we can be. With that 
Death, death, death all around us. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So I'm going to tell you something, brother and sister. You come here, you're going to get the word. So I don't care what color your skin is, white, black, brown, green, yellow, whatever. I don't care what it is. It don't make any difference to me because the Word of God is still the Word of God. Hallelujah. And this is what we need. We need a revival in our land, a call back to Jesus. And I get all the concerns. I get all of that. Praise God. But I, want, I, I think this is really interesting. There's a woman of color. We, I mean, she's a black woman. I'm not going to say woman of color. She's a black woman. Y'all don't have a problem with the color of your skin, do you? Praise God. Amen. Some of you. Yeah, you don't have no problem with that, do you, brother? You know what she said? Somebody asked, well, what are we going to do with the, 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 the people, the black people? What are we going to do with the, the, the people of black color? You know, what are we going to do with them? She said, nothing. Just leave them alone. She said, just leave them alone and let them fight. Let them rise up. Let them do what they're supposed to do. That's what she said. I know you don't like it, but I'm still going to tell you. You get up. You get God in your life. Come on, somebody. And by the power of the Spirit of God, you live for God. Stop making excuses for yourself. I don't care if you're black, white, green, yellow, whatever you are. Stop making excuses for yourself. Get a hold of God. Get full of the Holy Ghost. Life and light. So what are we going to do with the people, you know, the black race of people? She's a woman that's black. She said nothing. We're going to leave them alone. Let them rise up. We don't want to push them down. But, you know, you get what I'm saying to you today. But that's the same kind of environment. That Jesus walked into. And he didn't say, well, I'm here, you know, I got a dream. Well, that could get me in trouble. Because they made a God out of that man. And I appreciate everything Martin Luther King stood for. But I want to tell you something, he's not your God. Come on, somebody. Oh, I know you're not going to like this. And especially we put it out there. That, you know, we, thank God we don't put it out and make comments. Because they wouldn't like what I'm about to say. But before you make that man a God, you need to find out what kind of lifestyle he lived. Did you hear what I said? I know you don't want to hear it, but that's the truth. What kind of lifestyle did they live? No, Jesus Christ is the only true God. He's the one that brings light. He's the one that brings life. He's what we need right now. Say praise God. What are we going to do with the white people? Leave them alone. Let them get Jesus. Let them get God in their life. You get God in your life, things will change. The the atmosphere will change. The the social will change. Hallelujah. Praise God. This gospel works anywhere you preach it. You you take it into the Congo. You preach it in the Congo. You, You preach it where people, you know, people eat each other. 